And so Acts chapter 9. Now, um, there has been major persecution that's broken out, and we actually saw that because of the persecution in Jerusalem, it, it backfired, and as a result of people scattering, um, they were presenting the gospel into all these places they were scattering. So it actually, uh, the persecution was a catalyst for um, the gospel to advance into different people groups. And, uh, and so as we think about that, one of the leaders of of this persecution is a guy named Saul, who we later know uh, as Paul. And in Acts chapter 9, it, he really becomes the focus. And in Acts chapter 9, now we're going to go through Acts 9 verses 1 through 31. So I hope you don't have lunch plans. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, we're going we're gonna to make it happen, okay? Like, first gathering was gone when you came in, so you're good, all right? Um, but it really, you know, sometimes it's funny, uh, the way Scripture, how it's it, like this passage, it's like we could read 1 through 31, and it would be a solid Sunday. It just reads straight through. And, uh, and so we're going to read this in chunks together and then break it down and just see what happened here. So in Acts 9, verses 1 through 9, it says... But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And, he, and, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, many of us have heard this before, but maybe today... God's going to do something different with it for you. And I, and I want you to really hear this because Saul is not like, I, I just want to um, persecute the church. Like, I, I, I want to, like, give them a hard time or make it difficult. Like, he's breathing murderous threats. He wants it gone. He wants them gone. He wants to end this. And so you need to know that this very zealous individual, this high-ranking official, he goes to the high priest and he asks for letters so that he can go and arrest Jesus' followers who have fled from Jerusalem and are in Damascus. And, and, and the, the high priest would have that authority. Rome would give that authority to them to handle internal conflicts. And so he has these letters and he is on his way to find these people who are about the way. And when you see the way here in Scripture, it's referring to Christians. It was a name they would call Christians, um, is the way. And it's interesting because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way. And so we see this referred to them. Now, Damascus was this large and thriving commercial city. Um, it was 135 miles northeast of Jerusalem, and it had a really large Jewish population and multiple synagogues. And so Saul is sent to block the advance of the gospel to Damascus. But something happens on the way that brings him to the way. A light from heaven literally shines down, knocking them to the ground. And then a voice speaks. And it's interesting, in Acts 22, 9, we see that the people with him, they, they saw the light, and they, and they can hear something, but they couldn't understand what the Lord was saying to Saul. They didn't see um, that the Lord was, was, was speaking to him um, and, and only to Saul. And I want you to think, like, as this is happening for Saul, like, like, first of all, you just got knocked to the ground by just, like, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had lightning, like, hit really close 
to you, and it's like all you can see is the white, you know, of the light. I don't know if this is like that, but this is heaven, so it like dwarfs that light, and for whatever reason, it literally knocked them to the ground. It's undeniable that this isn't man-made, and, and so all of a sudden, this voice is speaking to him, and, and what is so powerful about this is, remember, Saul's mindset at this point is Jesus is dead. Jesus of Nazareth is dead. And so the leader is gone. I am going to end all the followers because we've already gotten the head of this thing. And so this has been his mindset. But all of a sudden, through this voice saying, you are persecuting me, I am the one you are persecuting, we see Jesus asks Saul a question that will have a revolutionary impact on the rest of his life. The very nature of the question means that Jesus is resurrected. He's alive. He's directly speaking to him. And, and that by persecuting Christians, and this is huge for us, Saul was actually persecuting the Lord. And he was standing in the way of what God is wanting to accomplish. He was actually persecuting Jesus. And Luke 10, 16, it's interesting. Jesus is sending out the 72, and he says this. If, if you ever question how, how tied in he is with his body, with the members of his body, it says in Luke 10, 16, the one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. In other words, as you're going out and, and, and people may come at you like this, say things like that, know that it's not against you, it's actually against me. And, and I always, I'm always, when I, when I see things like this and I hear him speak about this, about his body, about the head of the body, and, 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 and yet we're, we're, we think we can mess with the members of the head of the body, and, and, and so whenever I hear a Christian start, start like talking about another Christian or going after another Christian, I'm like, you better be careful. You better be careful, and you better hear what this says about that. You'll hear, you, like, talk about other Christians, other, uh, like other pastors and all this thing. You better be careful. You better be careful. Because he says, as you're persecuting them, you're actually persecuting Jesus. And, and this, this incredible moment of, of seeing the glorified Savior, it changes the entire direction of his life. Can you imagine what it was like for Saul in that moment to realize everything was wrong and backwards? That everything about his life, that because remember, he is doing this in his mind as an act of obedience to God. So, so in his mind, he's following God, and yet in this moment, through this supernatural encounter, he now realizes everything that he's been about is in opposition to God. And we see that, that the genuineness of Saul's conversion is immediately evident. And we see that from Acts 22.10, where he's in Rome and he's talking about this situation, this event that happened. And in Acts 22.10, we learned that what he asked the Lord is exactly what we should, should be asking. He says, what shall I do, Lord? Now you go, oh, well, that's not, that's not that big of a deal. No, it's a huge deal. Like, like when somebody comes to know Jesus and they, and they surrender their life to him, and they look at me and they say, so what should I do now? That is the most exciting question ever. Because it's, it's demonstrating and showing the validity of their conversion experience. It's, it's showing that this isn't about me anymore and my agenda and my way. I want to do what God wants me to do, so what is that? And so Saul is, is demonstrating, and this is an extremely intelligent individual. He is saying, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? Complete submission to the authority of the Father. What shall I do? You know, some of us used to ask that a lot. And, 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 and when we first came to Jesus, it was just like, God, I just want to be used by you. Like, like, you've changed everything about my life. I want to follow you and pursue you, so you just tell me what to do and I'll do it. But for whatever reason, over time, that question has stopped being asked. Now, maybe we say, maybe we pull it out in situations. God, if this job's for me, let me know. God, if, if, if I'm supposed to marry this person, do something. Like, like, we'll throw it out there. But do we really ask at the, at the very core of who we are, God, what do you want me to do with my life? 
And, and, and we see that seeing this glory left Paul powerless and helpless before the Lord. And he's literally, he's blinded. And then this proud individual is led by the hand in the most humble way to Damascus. And for three days, it says, he sits in darkness and fasts by having no food or drink, processing what has just happened. And you think about like, like sitting in that situation. You know, some of you in this room right now, um, if, we, if we really like looked inside, we would, we would notice that, that you have a lot of regrets. Maybe you feel guilt today. Maybe there's shame from your past. Maybe there's shame from the other day. Maybe there's things that, for whatever reason, you're in this room seeking something and and you're feeling inadequate, ill-equipped. I want you to think about what this guy's thinking after all he's done to hurt Jesus, the regret, the guilt, the faces, the the, the faces of the people, of the families that he has pulled out, that he has um, thrown into prison. Stephen, who he's there for that murder. I'm just picturing him seeing those eyes again and just having this time to really just go, what in the world have I done? But through this chapter, we actually get a glimpse of what God is about. And in Acts 9, verse 10, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Ananias is a, is a Jew living in Damascus uh, who has put his faith and trust in Jesus as the Messiah. And in Acts twenty two twelve, 12, it, it talks about Ananias and it says, He was a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who live there. So this is a guy that is known for being an incredible person, incredible follower of Jesus. People looked up to this guy. And, and, and Ananias has this vision from God and it's very specific. It's, it's not like, Walk down the path that's in front of you. No, it's, it, it's, it's very direct. Like you are going to go to this man named Saul who is praying and you are going to go heal him. He has seen you coming in a vision. You're going to go heal him. Now, if you are Ananias and God says that to you, you do what he does. That's a suicide mission. No. God, I, 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 I know how amazing and big you are, but in case you forgot, he's actually the main person who is in opposition to you. God, remember, remember God, he, what he's done and what he's coming here to do. God, I have heard that he is on his way here to imprison and to tear down everything that you're building up. So God, just in case you forgot, you need to know that, and you shouldn't send me. Like, 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 I don't want to do that. And 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 I see this, and I go, well, yeah, that's exactly what what I would have said as well, because Ananias at this point doesn't know that that literally Jesus has revealed himself and 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 knocked Saul off you know, whatever he was riding, onto the ground. He does not know that he's had that encounter yet and surrendered his life to God. All he knows is Saul is there, 
and, and has had a vision that he is going to come. And, 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 and from his vantage point, he don't want to do it. Have you ever told God no? It's funny, you laugh, but in the time, you <laughs> There's times when God may ask you to do something. And by all accounts, it is not going to make sense. And and in that moment, we are faced with the reality that either he is God or he's not. And how we respond in that communicates one of the other. And we see that the Lord overrules Ananias' objections and tells him that Saul has been specially chosen as an, adv- as an ambassador of the gospel. The call to ministry is not based on the urge of men, but on the sovereign choice of God. We don't qualify who God wants to use. He does. Like, did you hear that, church? Like, like we don't qualify who God's going to use He does. Now, now here's what's dangerous about this. Here's what's crept into our our, our culture. We have become really good at identifying the people that we think he should use. And we've also become really good at identifying the people that he doesn't want to use. And so we literally have treated people, spoken to people in such a way that communicates God can't use you. Like, yes, I I, I see some of this, but, but no, not you. Like, it's, 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 like we, we just hope that you can come to church sometime. Like, like you don't qualify who God's going to change the world with. You don't qualify them. God qualifies them. And so we need to know right now that, 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 that we have to get ourselves out of the way. Like, like by the standard you are qualifying people by, um, by whether you will receive what they say. Do you understand that Saul wouldn't have measured up to your qualifications? Saul, who, who's literally responsible for most of the verses you use that motivate you during the day, wouldn't have, wouldn't have qualified. He, he himself refers to himself as a chief of sinners. Like, like Saul did not walk around going, God, you're lucky. You got me. No, not at all. Everything we read is the opposite of that. Yet God will use Saul to take the gospel, it says, to the Gentiles, to the Jews, and to even kings. And I want you to hear this right now. If you've ever felt neglected, beaten down by the church because you have been told you are unqualified, you don't measure up, you've made too many mistakes, you are too far gone, you need to pick yourself up this morning and see what this says. Because the very people, even this godly individual, Ananias, who he would say, God, no, 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 that is the very person God would use to transform the world with the gospel. And so who am I? Like, who am I to look at these people? Who am I to, to, to like, judge other people and, and where, they're, where they're not at and where they need to be to be used by him? He qualifies those people. Look at who he used. He would not have measured up to our standards. The Lord tells Ananias that Saul, who had inflicted much suffering on Christians, now will experience much suffering himself as he carries out his mission. And then Ananias says, okay, God, I'll talk to him. Saul later talks about his suffering in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 33. It's, it's, it's insane, all that he suffered for the gospel. But I want you to think about this because maybe God is calling you to be an Ananias to somebody. And, and I want to just challenge you with that because maybe you haven't judged people like per se, but maybe you have limited Place limits on what God may want you to do in in someone else's life. And just maybe there's somebody who you in your mind have just said, no, God can't, nah, they're unredeemable, or they're just just too far away, or or, or I just don't think that could happen, or or we don't get along, or or they believe this, or or this is their background, or they're mad at the church, or they vote this way, or they think this way, they look this way, and so so that's not for me. Like, God, I'm going to go this way in ministry, and you bring those people in to my lane, and then we'll 
will work God, and he may be saying, just like Ananias, and you may be walking with him, he may say, "Uh uh-uh, I want you to jump out of your lane, and I have got somebody over there that you may have nothing in common with, but I'm going to use you to love on them, to bring them up, and to be an extension of the gospel of grace. And in that moment, when that happens, will I respond and will I go out there and, and talk to somebody or, and, and share with somebody what, what he wants me to share? Or in that moment, will I allow all these things that I visibly see, what I think I know, will I allow those things to hinder me from talking to a person, a person who a lot of you were? I know some of your stories. There's a lot of you that didn't wake up just like accepting the gospel. There's a lot of you in here with some major baggage. There's a lot of you in here that didn't come to know Jesus going, yep. No, it was what? You were broken. You were broken. You needed a savior. You you needed to know what grace was. You had never experienced it in your life. And you came to him because nobody else could extend to you what he freely offered you. We need to be that. And so if he's calling you to be an Ananias, or maybe in the past he has has told you to speak to somebody, and maybe you neglected it. Maybe you justified it away to God like Ananias was trying to do. Go back. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And here's why you don't have to be afraid. Like God's always setting the stage for us when he calls us to do that. What do we find that Saul was doing during this time? He was praying. He was praying, it says. And this is huge to see because, you know, when he's fasting and, and we talk about fasting and, and, and removing things out of our lives to hear from God, like as you remove, you also need to pursue. And so Saul has had this encounter with God. He removes everything. He's broken down, but then he starts to dialogue with God. He starts to talk to God. He starts to reach out to God and pray to him. And as he does that, God responds to God. That by saying, I am bringing someone to you who is going to heal you. Ananias goes and heals Saul. And Saul regains his eyesight. He's filled with the Holy Spirit who's about to empower him to preach the gospel. Empower him to go through unimaginable suffering. And then he's baptized. And, and it talked about how they spent some time with him, the believers there. And, and can you imagine what kind of praise was going out to God after that? Like, can you imagine that? Like, like, like literally, you've got families in Damascus praying against Saul. Like, literally, God I pray against this man. He is in opposition to you. He is coming. God, I have kids. I pray that you will protect my family, my kids, from this evil person who is trying to destroy the work that you are doing, that you've done in my life, in my family's life, in so many other people's lives. God, I pray that you will protect us from this person who's coming to to destroy everything that you've done. And and, and what's crazy is God's not not like, okay, I'll protect you. No, no. Like, Like God takes it a whole other step farther. God literally uses a light from heaven and goes bam and knocks Saul down to where it is unavoidable that Jesus is alive and he's active and he's Lord and Saul declares that and now Saul, the one who came to put them to death in prison, trying to destroy them, is now following Jesus. And they are sitting there with Saul like this. God just wrecked their view of prayer. As I, was, as I was looking at this and studying this, I literally, I just stopped and he said, Steve, you're not praying big enough. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, I, I pray sometimes and, and I think I'm kind of reaching. But he's like, no, 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 I want you to really pray. I want you to see, as, as, I, as I was reading this, like, and I was just trying to put myself, what, what that must have been like to be living in Damascus and to have that and what, what my prayer would have been. And, and, and I probably would have been like, hey, God, I saw what you did in the Old Testament. You opened the ground up. If you could just do that, that would be cool. Just take him out. And, and that, like in my wildest dreams, I would never imagine that he would not only protect my family but save the very person who was in opposition and then use them to be the catalyst for the gospel around the world. And they're sitting there with him, praising God for 
that moment. God's amazing. God's amazing. In 19, it it continues, and, and it says, For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket." This man, who once persecuted followers of Jesus, is now there proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, to all these synagogues, to where he was going to go to arrest people. And he goes, and and, and I just want you to think, both sides are confused. I mean, literally the people who were on his side are like, he's here, let's go. And, And he's preaching, and they're like, Like, is, is he using reverse psychology? Like, what, what, what's happening? Um, and, and then you have the other people who are, are like, Saul is here, and all of a sudden, what? And then, and, then, and if you were me, and, and, and I'm telling you right now, would you just be like, oh, yes, kids, let's go. Like, no. We're like, yeah. Like, and that's, there's like major conflict. Like there's major conflict. I mean, he experienced Jesus and, and, and was so cool. I love when someone experiences Jesus and for the very first time, and they are like, let's go. <laughs> Where can I go? I've got to tell people. And Saul is so jacked up, excited. The Holy Spirit is working, and he goes in there. And I mean, it is just like people are frozen in their tracks. And then all of a sudden, it, we see that, that, that those people that were on his side are now like, well, wait a second, you're wrong. And, and, and they're trying to like, com, like confound him, but, but they're being confounded because, one, he has been trained beyond any of them. He's smarter than them. He knows the Old Testament better than them. But now he has literally found the key, Jesus Christ, that unlocks the Old Testament. And they are just like, oh, no. Like, well, we, we can't do anything. He's winning. <laughs> and, 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 and people are, are starting to respond in all of this, and, 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 and all these people are, are, are coming to know Jesus, and he is passionately proclaiming him. The Spirit is using him. There are times when you just know the Spirit is using someone, and you're like, the Spirit is using that person. The Spirit's using that person. And in Galatians 1.17, we find out that, that from verse 23, and when it said, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, he actually left Damascus. He actually left Damascus. It says in Galatians 1.17 um, that, that it says this, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So, so Saul, he's preaching right away, and then he leaves he leaves to Arabia, to, to this area that, that it's called the kingdom of uh, Nabatea. And, and as he's there, the Nabataeans lived in the land south of Damascus and southeast of Palestine. And he probably spends anywhere from a year and a half to two years in that region. And we're not sure specifically what he was doing during that break, but no doubt processing everything that's happened, processing through like like where he stands, how he can be used by God to be an ambassador to the Gentiles, to these people that that he's uniquely trained to be able to reach. And so he's going through this process with God, similar to a process that many of us have gone under, uh, whether it's discipleship or or just taking a, a time where we just needed to be refined in who we are before God and how do we articulate our faith. And then he returns to Damascus for this second phase of ministry, and he faces opposition and the fear of death to where they're literally guarding the city walls to get him. And he escapes through a hole in the wall. 
What a ministry stretch. And then in verses 26 through 31, it says, And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord, and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So Saul Saul immediately, uh, after escaping, he goes to Jerusalem. And in Galatians 1.18, we find out that actually his purpose to go to uh, Jerusalem was to meet Peter. He's heard about Peter. He wants to just get to know Peter. um, And uh, Peter's reputation was huge in that during that time and and so he goes to connect with Peter and as he's there he finds that everyone is still suspicious about the authenticity of his faith isn't it hard when you're trying to do the right thing and people are questioning your heart isn't that hard it hurts a little worse doesn't it when people question your motives and they don't even know you when they say, oh, they're, they're, this person's about that, and, and you're like, man, I'm not. That's hard. And so he's going through this, and, and that's got to be rough. But in the same sense, we're like, well, it's understandable. We would have been, been skeptical as well if we were there after what he had been a part of and done. And, and we see these, these disciples, they're, they're doubting the sincerity of his profession as a believer. And, and then we see this other individual, this incredible individual named Barnabas, who stands up for him and defends him and starts explaining all that has happened that God has done in Saul's life, in Damascus, and all these things. Barnabas stands up and defends Saul. And here's what's so important that we need to see. Saul stands up and and, Barnabas defends Saul against Jesus' followers. You catch that? You know, I find more and more that the people that come through these doors... The people that are coming to know Jesus, their wounds, their scars, their hurts, and their pains are not so much from people who are in opposition to God, but so many times now I am finding that it is from people who say they're Christian. And one of the most difficult things for someone that's brand new and and trying to follow Jesus is when someone else who says, oh, I'm a Christian too, and then they start doubting them. They start throwing this stuff at them. They start saying, well, well, if you were really, you know, uh, following Jesus, you wouldn't do that, or you wouldn't do this, or it's not genuine, it's not real. And they don't even know their full story. They don't know what they've come out of. They they don't know any of those things. And yet, someone else who this person would think is going to help me walk through this difficult journey. I'm going to try and live for God, and I've never done it before, and I'm scared about it, and you should be helping me, and yet you're actually someone that is against me. You're someone that's making me question everything about myself, and yet I was so sure that I wanted to follow him. We have so many people that have so many scars and wounds, and it's not from people that don't believe in God, that don't want anything to do with God. So many times it's actually from other people in a church. It's other people saying, I follow Jesus too. And so we see this opposition, and Barnabas stands up to all the believers. And listen, you guys, it is so easy to pull coals and to shoot at other people. It is so easy. I mean, I think of like, if someone wanted to poke holes in me and shoot at me, there are so many things you could do. I mean, it would be so easy. I mean, literally, I'll get in my car, you can follow me and be like, he's a bad driver. I don't want to go to that church. Well, I'm sorry. I've still got some California in me, okay? And so, uh, like, 
That's easy. You could literally see me talk to my wife, and you could see me lose my cool. You could see me represent myself to my wife in a way that I wish I hadn't, and you could see that. And you could literally go, oh, I see how he treats his wife. I don't want anything to do with him. You could see me lose my cool with my kids or do something that, man, I wish I didn't do with my kids. And you could easily go, oh, man, I wouldn't follow him. I wouldn't listen to him. I, this is the sixth teaching I've done in four days, I think, and I'm probably going to say something. You could easily go, I can't believe he said that. You guys, like, like it is really easy to look at other people and to shoot at the holes in their lives. Because we're humans. We are going to make mistakes continually. So that's easy. What's hard, and yet what God calls us to do, is to link arms and defend each other. And when you see someone like that, that makes a mistake, that does something that maybe they wish they hadn't done, that says something they maybe wish they hadn't said, Let's not be the people that goes, ha, I knew it. I knew your faith wasn't real. I knew you really didn't mean it. Can you imagine how that would break someone's heart? Guys, and there's people like that in this room that have had people do that to them. What's hard, and yet what God asks us to do is to actually go, hey, like, it's okay. Let's get up. Let's link arms together. How can I defend you? How can I be your advocate? I'm going to help you. I, I, I know, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. But let's move forward together. And we see Barnabas. And Barnabas throughout Scripture, that is his M.O. That is what he's about. And he literally stands up to other Jesus followers who are doubting, who are criticizing, who don't want anything to do with Saul. And he says, no, 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 no. I'm with him. And this is the real deal. And then we see Saul start preaching and proclaiming Jesus in Jerusalem to the Hellenists, the Jews who are Greek-speaking and, and not from Jerusalem. And he's, he's literally preaching the gospel to them. And we see that opposition happens. But we see the believers see that, that what Saul said he was, he actually was. You guys, you want to authenticate your faith? You want other people to buy in what, what, what you're saying, what you're selling about Jesus to be true? Let them see your actions. Let them see. If you're going to do a seminar in, on evangelism, you better be sharing your faith. Like, I hope the standard I'm held to is that I'm actually doing what I say. And so I can have the greatest theology in the world. I could teach the deepest Bible study ever. But if there is no action response fruit out of that, then what is it? And so we see Saul that through his actions, through him not just saying, this was my experience, this is what happened, I'm smarter than you, he goes out and starts preaching this and living this, and that's when they're like, oh yeah, we're, we're with you. And not only that, they see that they're going to kill you. We'll help you. And they send him out of there, and he goes back to his hometown, and he's there from anywhere from three to five years in Tarsus, where he's from strengthening himself and sharing what has happened. And the church all around the known world continues to grow numerically and spiritually. And as I was thinking about this and what happened here, you know, I started wondering, like, you know, here, we're, we're here, we're at Ecclesia, this church. Is this a church where a Saul could come in and feel welcomed? Is this a church where we give people a chance? Will we give them a chance? Is this a church where we, we stand up, we defend each other? Like we defend each other? Where we, where we actually pursue people that maybe the world or, or other, other Christians have labeled unqualified? Do we actually pursue those people? Or do we do the safe prayer from a distance? God, use somebody else to reach them. Or no, are we actually the people that are going to say, I want to be used by you, God, to go, to go there. To, to Use me, God, to reach that person. That's a dangerous prayer. That's a difficult prayer because he's going to answer it. And, 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 but I pray that that, that that prayer permeates our church. 
I pray that people sense that, know that when they come in here, that, that this is a place where they can come, they can wrestle through difficulties in life, decisions, that maybe they've been beaten, maybe, maybe they're worn down, maybe they've had a horrible experience by somebody talking about Christ in a way that has nothing to do with Christ, and they're here, and, and they just need to find a place where they can have some relationship, where they, where they can grow again, where they can experience people that actually care about them, that will reach out to them, even though they may not look exactly like everyone else. Or, or talk like everyone else. And this has to be a place where people can come that are wounded and experience Jesus in the hope that he offers. You guys, this, this story, this incredible story, is, gives us a window into how God operates and who God uses and who he's looking for. And, and, and so if you felt like you're unqualified, you don't measure up, you better be careful. He may be looking at you right now going, oh, I'm going to use you big time. And, 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 and here's the thing, like 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 16, I'm just going to read this, and I want this to just sink in today as I read these verses. This is Paul, and, and as he says these words, this is the heart of the gospel. In 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 16, it says this, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, Oh, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Oh, thank you, God, for that. Because that's why you're able to stand here and sit here. That's why we're going to be able to worship here in a moment. That's why we're able to respond. Because you guys, none of us were qualified. None of us. There is nobody in this room that should walk around going, God is so lucky he got me. There's none of us like that. You guys, when, when you read that and you think, man, like all that Saul did, never forget where Saul came from and never forget what that means about the gospel. That means you don't give up. That means that, that, that regardless of, of what you've been through, regardless of, of the damage, I mean, you want to talk about baggage and damage left behind? This means that regardless of the baggage and the damage and the relationships that maybe you've ruined, maybe you've destroyed, and, and, and you walk in here and you go, that's my story, that means that there's an opportunity for that to change forever. There is an opportunity for redemption because of what we just read. And so there's nobody in this room that can sit here and go, I'm without hope today because of what we just read, because of what Jesus supernaturally did by intervening into Saul's life. And maybe, just maybe, it may not be a bright light through here, although that one's pretty bright. It, it, it may just be you hearing and responding and, and for the first time, like, allowing him to establish himself in your life. Establish himself. That's my prayer. And I believe we can be that, church. I'm excited. I'm excited. And Easter's coming. Let's go. Are you ready? Let's go. Let's pray.